Okay, so Taryn asks, how do we get the brakes back on? Functional neurology exercises, gut health, exercise bike. Um, that's a really good question. I like that. The reason this question is hard to answer is because the brakes are made up of all of these different areas. You see all these little dots? All of these little areas have to work together to create this output that goes out here to the heart, to the vessels. So to know how to get them back on, you want to know where it's happening. So is it something that's happening out in the frontal lobe? Is it something that's happening in the parietal lobe? Is it affecting insular outputs or the activity in the amygdala or into the insular cortex, et cetera, or, or the, excuse me, the cingulate cortex? Is it happening in the hypothalamus, midbrain, lower portion of the brainstem and the medulla, right? Is it happening from ascending fibers that are coming up into the spinal cord? We've even touched on excitatory inhibitory ratios, and that's like a whole nother level of this. Um, so all of these things are, are interacting together, which is kind of what makes it a little bit hard and why you're listening to me on a live on YouTube. And this isn't just like something that every doctor does because it's hard um, and it's, compli it's complicated. So to be able to understand which, so the exercises I would do for someone that are having a change in this hypothalamic output, that's going to be different than if the problem is in the RVLM. If the problem is in the RVLM and this is running well, then we can use some of these stimuli to be able to help it. Or to, to say that a different way, depending on where this is at, you're going to, you're going to think about how to stimulate it differently. And depending on where in the neuraxis the problem is, some treatments will work and some will not. So you want to try to pick the right ones. Um, so I tend to bias toward doing things that are going to have um, neurological consequences. We're teaching the brain how to activate. Some people may choose to reflect gut health, but um, your gut is one feedback mechanism that's going to be able to signal how it's doing into the MTS here. And it's going to be able to help us deliver fuel to the blood, which is really wonderful. Um, but will it solve a lesion up here? No, it won't. Um, exercise bike can be really great because it allows us to be able to stimulate multiple areas within the brain. It allows us to be able to drive endothelial activity. We talked about that a little last week, which can be good just to like as a general strategy. And if the general strategy works, I'm all in for that. What I find is that when people are seeking me out, it's because the general stuff isn't isn't getting the job done. Uh, it's not happening on its own, which is why we have to kind of be more deliberate in where we're targeting in here. So um, you may find that like something down here is more responsive to vestibular inputs, whereas something up here might be responsive more to eye movement activities or um, like frontal like frontal mechanisms or imagery or um, doing mental tasking, stuff like that. Or, you know, and on and on you go. Um, and obviously, there's a lot to talk about there. But um, so any of those things can be helpful. I tend to lean toward things that are going to target these areas specifically within their metabolic demand from a vascular perspective and then go from there. Gut stuff is really good. You want to have a healthy gut. But part of having a healthy gut is having a healthy brain. Uh, if you don't have a healthy brain, your gut's not going to be in great shape. So you got to kind of think about those two things together. And then exercise writ large is one of the best things humans can do if you can do it. A lot of people that are having these types of problems, well, part of the way they find it is because they can't exercise anymore. So we've got this other hurdle that we have to get to to be able to get people back into exercising again and pushing themselves again. What are the symptoms and causes of what's often described as adrenal exhaustion? Ooh, okay. We're going deep. I actually made I made a presentation on this. I've done a presentation on this, um, and I made another one recently and decided we weren't ready to share it yet, but I'm gonna give you just like a little uh, like a little look into that. So the the term adrenal exhaustion comes out of the work of Hans Selye. Think about like early 1900s, right? And that was at the time, just to give you a frame of reference. That was at the time when people were winning Nobel Prizes for discovering hormones. So that's like where we were in the science. So everybody was real hyped on hormones. It's like, like people are hyped on AI right now. That's how people felt about hormones back then, right? So that was like the lens we were looking at the world through. Uh, lots changed since then. But the idea was that 
oh, maybe when these people are really, really tired, they're getting exhausted. What's happening is we're losing some of that hormone activity. And that hormone is adrenaline. And oh, we're not, we don't have enough adrenaline. So that's why we're getting tired. What gland releases adrenaline? The adrenal glands, that must be where the problem is. We were like super into glandulars, right? Um, and that's cool. But then fast forward 100 years, and what we realize is that the adrenal glands, um, number one, adrenaline is, a, is basically a, it's a metabolic hormone that helps us to be able to liberate and use glucose. So it just helps us to be able to utilize the glucose in our system. Cool. And, but it can give us a big shot in the arm of, of activity. You guys have felt this if you've ever like gotten super excited, people have it hunting, presenting, whatever, and you'll just get the, that shakiness as that adrenaline kind of dumps into the system. So it's like a very potent tool. But the adrenal glands are just our glands. They're like bags. They get stimulated by the brain um, to be able to release the adrenaline. So the thought for a while was kind of like, well, maybe there's just not enough substrate. Uh, like we don't have enough stuff to make adrenaline with and the adrenal glands get tired and then they get fatigued. Um, and, and maybe that's true, but it's not likely to be true. What we're more looking at is these central consequences like we talked about today, where areas in the hypothalamus are not able to adequately stimulate the adrenal glands. The sympathetic activity is what actually uh, stimulates the outer portion of that. It controls the vascularity to the adrenal glands and allows it to be able to signal normalized release. And sometimes we can just get too much that gets pumped out or not enough that gets pumped out relative to what it's being signaled to do. Um, we can wrap cortisol into that conversation, but we'll do that another day um, as a signaling molecule that helps us understand that. Again, cortisol is also a glucose-related tool. It's mostly around keeping glucose levels stable. We, tell, we call it a stress hormone, but it's only a stress hormone in so much as things that are stressors, good, bad, otherwise, are things that require energy, and the way that we mobilize energy is to liberate and use glucose. So, um, to, so the original question, symptoms and causes of that, um, I don't think it's the best way to look at it, to be honest. I think, I think most people would suggest that it's not, that's, that's not a very accurate way to look at or understand the system. Most of the time when people are describing adrenal fatigue, what they are really talking about is having a problem with, um, regulating glucose levels. So when you look at this from a functional medicine perspective, most of the time when we're trying to address adrenal function, what you're doing is really stabilizing glucose levels, stabilizing insulin levels that allow you to be able to um, to maintain that energy output. I'm going to catch a lot of flack from my functional medicine friends, but I've actually had kind of a lot of conversations with my functional medicine friends about this topic, and we are, we are in agreement. So uh, if that's a thing that, that you are working through, in most cases, starting from understanding what's happening with your glucose levels, what happens, you know, simplest way is like, if you don't eat, do you get hangry? When you eat, do you feel satisfied or do you get lethargic? Like these simple questions around eating are good ways to understand that. And then you can get things like a continuous glucose monitor, which are super cheap and easy to get. And you can see what's happening. And then that may be a really good way to understand is, is my actual problem that I'm dealing with a problem with regulating um, my, my sugar levels.